This podcast is sponsored by Nobody. Hey dudes, welcome to Splat from the Past. The only 80s themed horror and sci-fi show where things could get totally radical. Now today, I will be welcoming a very funny lady. Um, Those of you who watch stand-up comedy in the 80s and 90s remember her. Diana Jordan. She's a very funny lady from the South. And uh, she's coming on the show today. Um, She got to be... On an evening at the Improv, HBO's Women of the Night 4, um, she got to be um, in Jerry Maguire. I hope that's not an IMDb flubber because it would be great to have someone from the set of Jerry Maguire on this podcast. And um, now she's doing, uh, I have to ask her more in depth about it, self-healing, healthcare stuff uh, nowadays. Um, as she still does stand up, um, mostly in the corporate world, um, but she does the, the self-healing, healthcare stuff as well, and we're going to talk about all that stuff today, and it's going to be pretty, pretty good. I can't wait. It's going to be spectacular and hilarious. We're going to get some laughs out of this episode. So yeah, here is my interview with Diana Jordan. Hey, Diana. Hey, I thought I thought you were calling me. That's okay. <laughs> it's okay. We're not curing cancer or anything. Uh, things get confused. <laughs> okay. We're not? Oh, no. Yeah. <laughs> this uh, is where are you? Redding, California. It's a really shitty town. What's the name of it? Hollywood? That's where I'm at right now. I'd rather be in Hollywood than Redding. <laughs> Oh, I know red. Oh, yeah. I don't blame you. Yeah, I'm the only Democrat in this town, aside from my mother. <laughs> oh. <laughs> this, this is such a great okay. honor. Thank you for taking the time today. Sure. So, sure. going back in time, did you know growing up that you were funny? Uh, let's see. Did I know? Oh yeah, it's radio. Don't be, don't be pausing. Uh, <laughs> you know, it's so funny because I wrote this question down for myself not that long ago. Yeah. Thinking that I should put that in my uh, uh, speaking stuff because I think people do wonder that. I think they wonder. When did you know you were funny? Did you ever think you were funny? Was anybody in your family ever funny? Mm-hmm. So they're probably already thinking that. So you're right. That and my answer that that the best way I can answer that question is I was always, you know, I'll put it this way. My mother, when I was 35, I'm now 36, mm-hmm. which is a lot. And uh, <laughs> my mother said to me, "You know, you intimidated me your whole life." And my mother was the sweetest kindest, never cussed mm-hmm. woman in the world. And I was like, well, mother, what are you talking about? I can't believe I started to cry, right? Yeah. And she said, you just were always out of the box, you know? And she said, I didn't want to ruin any of that. But, you know, you you know, you know, always were so creative and funny. This was like when I, I didn't start to stand up till I was... 32. Mm-hmm. So, the best way I can say in junior high and high school, if you were to ask any of my friends right now, yes, one word to describe Diana Jordan, I guarantee you, here's what they would say. No, two words. She's crazy. That's, what, that's <laughs> all I've ever heard. You ever hear that? And I think that means funny, I, but it really hurt me, you know? Yeah. Because I wasn't crazy. I was, I looked at things differently than everybody else did. But that's a, and you know how many people would give anything to be able to do that, and they try to learn that, and they train themselves to do that, even writers. And, 
and you can learn to do that, I think, in writing. But I think for stand-up, it, it's really an innate yeah. type of thing. To look in a twisted kind of way. Mm-hmm, absolutely. Um, but, uh, yeah, I was reading that uh, you were... Um, yeah, you had undiagnosed ADD and dyslexia growing up. Oh yes, yeah. Well, there's part of your crazy right there. <laughs> I have yeah. I have ADD and Asperger's, and I was bullied a lot growing up. I still am in 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 some instances, but I I understand. Yeah, me too. Me too. Me too. Even yeah. Yeah. That's, and that's what I think it was, but I didn't have a name for it because we didn't. Use, in your neighborhood, there was always the town bully, right, or right. something like that. It was never people are, uh, you know, bullying you. I mean, my brother used to bully me. It was horrible. Just awful. Mm -hmm. and, but I didn't know what it was. It was just, oh, boys will be boys. You know, and that's the way your brother shows that he loves you. You know, well, now we know that's not, uh, but if it hadn't been for that, I wouldn't have had a career. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> made you who you are today. Um, I'm telling you, that ADD is, is not even anything to be, and just like, that's nothing to be laughed at. It is, it's, it, it's, every, every job I've ever had, I've been fired from, except stand-up. Yeah. <laughs> and every job. I would get a job as a secretary, because I was cute and I was funny, so everybody wanted to hire me, right? Right. I work at a department store. You know, I talk to all of the people. I worked at Tavern on the Green when I lived in New York, and I got fired. He goes, you're talking, I told you to stop talking to everybody. And I said, I'm just trying to get good tips because I, I, I'm from Oklahoma. You know, I, I, I'm, you know, I'm just friendly. And he goes, well, I don't want you to be friendly. <laughs> <laughs> and he, and, okay, wait, I got to tell you this story. Okay. Mm -hmm. So he fired me. Now, you know, I'm like, uh, this is like, you know, 30 year. I was in my 30, again, still in my 30s. Right. And decided, I, my mother said, why are you going to torture yourself to live in New York? And I, I said, I don't know. And I did. <laughs> anyway, but this, this is an unbelievable story. So this man, he was such an asshole, mm -hmm. right? The maitre d at Tavern on the Green. Yeah. Paul black guy, beautiful tuxedo every night, you know, always, madame, this and that. And, you know, I'm in there and I'm just saying, hey, what do you want to drink? Well, it might be a while. I don't know how to make that. You know, it's just being funny and silly. So anyway, he, after about three months, he fired me. And about 10 or 15 years later, I'm in, L I'm in L.A. I only made it one year in New York. I'm in L.A., and my mm -hmm. sister and I go to the famous polo lounge at the Beverly Hills Hotel. Right. Guess who the maitre d' was? That man. Michael Keaton? No, the man from New, from New York. Oh, you said, I thought you said Batman. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Wow. And, and when I saw him, right, as we were walking in, getting ready to walk into the lounge, my knees buckled, and <laughs> I said to my sister, we have to go, we have to go, we have to go, we have to go. And she, like, I mean, I'm having a, a full-blown panic attack. Because this was like in New York, it was the dead of winter, it was my only job, it was a cherished job in New York, and he was so mean and so unkind. Yeah. And my sister was like, what's going on? And I said, that's the man, that's, the, I mean, you would have thought the guy raped me. My, my reaction was so visceral, <laughs> you know? And I, and I, and my sister said, well, does this mean we're not going to have lunch? You know, that, cause that's my sister. And I said, no, we can't go there. I cannot go in there. I can't, I can't go in there. And she goes, well, I'm going to go up and tell him what I think about him. I said, no, you're not. <laughs> but anyway, that was a weird one. Yeah. But my dad was funny. My dad was very, very funny. And my sister's very funny. And my brother was funny. So, you know, it goes into that thing of nature-nurture. 
Right, yeah. I mean, some family members are funny, but they're not exactly funny to make a living at it, but they're funny, you know? Yeah, they're silly. Silly funny. So, 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 so what year did you first go up on stage and stand up, and where was it? I don't remember what year it was. I know I was like 32. Mm -hmm. I did this thing where... Um, uh, I would go up at the, when the Laugh Factory had just, just was starting. Yeah. The, I would go do five comedy rooms in one night. They would all be in a deli or in a, the back of a restaurant. Of you know course. what I mean. Oh, yeah. But, but let, let me tell you who some of the other comedians were. Okay. Kevin Pollock. Yep. Kevin Nealon. Kevin Nealon. You Neelan. know, they were there trying out new material, too. Yep. And then you get your, you know, you're just trying to get your three minutes, your five minutes, your, you know, you got to build. What people don't understand about stand-up is you can't stand in your living room or your bathroom and tell jokes yeah. and think they work. They yeah. have, you <laughs> have to risk being crushed. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's it. It's like, a rela it's like a relationship, you know, when people go, oh, just take a leap of faith with him. Oh, just, if you get your heart broken, you'll get over it. Hell no. <laughs> I know all about that. I, I can take a risk on stage, but man, don't break my heart. <laughs> Did you see uh, Stephanie Hodge there? Uh, I'm sure. I know Stephanie. Yes, she's one of my closest friends, and she comes on the podcast at least a couple times a year. We talk for literally two hours. I love her. She's awesome. Well, here's a, here's a, okay, here's an interesting bit yeah. of trivia. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I got an audition for a, a part on a show, and the show went. What the hell was the name of it? She would know because she got the role. I didn't get it. Yeah. For the TV show, the TV show she did. Oh, happily, uh, unhappily ever after. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, I got, I was, it was between the two of us. Yeah, she got it. Oh. I hate her. <laughs> <laughs> oh, she's gonna love that. Ruined I'll tell my you. Career. She's right that she ruined my career. She's yeah. going to love that. Yeah, you probably would have been on the entire run. She got, like, fired, like, just before the last season. <laughs> or she oh, left. She did. did she? Or she left, one of the two. I can't remember. We've talked about it so many times. You, you would think that I would know about it by now. <laughs> yeah. Wonder what. I thought the show I thought the show only lasted one season. Oh, no, it went for four years. It did? Oh, yeah. I really hate her. Well, nobody it watched it. <laughs> Whatever. If it makes you feel any better, nobody watched it. <laughs> I know, but still, it was money and it was a credit. And, yeah. You know, and that guy, the guy, I remember the guy. That, that he was basically the star. Right. And he works all the time. He right. Still, he has worked solid. Oh yeah, she loved working with him. She told me. Uh, did you see like Carrie Snow and Lois Bromfield and like Rich Scheidner yep. there? Yeah. I hate Rich Scheidner. Now, I really do hate him. Really? Oh, yeah. He's an ass. Yeah, he is. He's, he's very opinionated, I will say that. <laughs> <laughs> I don't hate Stephanie. That's a joke. Yeah. But I, okay, it's so funny because I was at another audition years ago. Right. And I didn't know that the writer was Rich Scheidner. Right, mm -hmm. and I'd only yeah. run across him a few times because he was a bigger headliner, you know, than me. And uh, so anyway, he just sits there. He's not giving me anything back. He wouldn't read with me. Somebody else had to read the scene with me, and uh -huh. he was just acting weird, right? And I thought, yeah. what's going on with him? So he goes, "Let me walk you out." So he walks me. We get in the elevator and. And I remember, you know, it's such a coward. He stared at the floor and he said, uh, you know, I really don't appreciate you stealing that bit of mine. Oh, God. And I said, what? Yeah. What are you talking about? And he said, the bit about how uh, 
men speak on the average 17,000 words a day, women on the average 35,000 words a day. Oh, I said, God. what are you talking about? I said, I read that in a magazine. And he goes, no, you didn't. You stole it from me. I go, I've never even seen you live. And I, and I just, I said, gosh, I, I, you know, and he goes, I want you to stop doing it. So I just turned around and laughed. I never stopped doing it. Of course I kept doing it. I read it in a magazine. <laughs> God. Yeah, that happens yeah. all the time, doesn't it? Oh, my God. I, I, I can't stand oh, that shit. It, oh, It never I happened to me. Let's, let's go to the comedians I hate. How about that? It never happened to me, but uh, but I, I I did. There were a lot of guys who stole my stuff, but I, I, but I was never accused of it, thank God. But, yeah. Well, that's the best one. Here's the best one. Yeah. Dave Chappelle. I hate Dave Chappelle. He took a bit I from you? I almost slit my wrist when he got, like, the Kennedy honor. I'm like, what the fuck is going on in the world? Yeah. I just, I never thought he was that funny anyway. But anyway, so one night <laughs> I'm at the Laugh Factory. Yeah. And I'm a headliner by then. Yeah. And I do this very unique joke, and I'll tell you the joke. Mm -hmm. But first, okay, so I do the joke. I do, I do my set. And uh, the next night, all through the night, comics are calling me from back east. And I'm like, what, you know, what is going on? Okay, well, what happened was, mm -hmm. they, they're saying, Chappelle just did your joke on Letterman. Right. I said, are you, because you know that burns it, it's gone. Yeah. And they said, and then they're, they're saying, but I said, well, you know, first, I'm, I'm first, the first thing I said was what any comic would say, well, did it get a laugh? <laughs> 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 and they said, no. And I said, how could that not get a laugh? That's so funny. And, they, and somebody said, he totally screwed it up. And even Letterman was like, okay, well, all right. And um, what the joke was, and this is how you know somebody stole a joke if it's so unique, right? Yeah. This one was, Okay, you know, there's that book, Women Are From Venus, Men Are From Mars. Right. You know, well, I, I personally don't think that women are from Venus. I think all women were born on this beautiful island off the coast of Greece called the Isle of Clitoris. <laughs> yeah. And there's no men there because they can't fucking find it. Yeah. Right, Joe? <laughs> Very unique. So what he does is he says, he has Letterman set him up by saying, you know, well, I heard you just bought a new house. Yeah, I'm calling it the Isle of Clitoris. <laughs> you know, that way nobody will come over. He, he didn't tie it to men and women. And, and of course, Letterman's looking at him like, okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, I don't like him because, you know, he was on his way, you know, he, he made his name, don't be taking my, and he was there at the lab factory the night before right. I was there, and I did that joke in my set. Oh my God, that's terrible. Did you, uh, uh, did you uh, go to the comedy store? Uh, I didn't really work the comedy store, I worked the improv more. Uncle and Bud's house of no eye that. contact. I worked the eye contact the most. <laughs> Yeah, Uncle Bud's house of no eye contact. <laughs> oh, no kidding! I love that. That's what Steve. Oh that's what God. Steve Pearl used to call it. You know Steve? Huh? You know Steve Pearl? No, I don't think so. Oh, he's the funniest guy ever. He was a comedy store guy. He used to call the improv Uncle Bud's house of no eye contact. <laughs> I love that. That's for sure. Uh, and, and, and only with the one eye that the monocle was in. Oh, my God. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know why he had that. I really don't. I used to watch an evening at the improv all the time, and sometimes he wouldn't have it on, but you could just see it hanging there, you know? Well, you got to admit, it was classy looking. It was cool looking. And I think what he did, which is really what monocles mm -hmm. are for, if one were to work, maybe I'll get one. Is it's for reading, you, so you don't pull glasses out. So mm -hmm. he didn't want to pull reading glasses out. Right. So he had, you know, that's what it was for. 
Yeah. And then uh, I guess people just said, hey, bud, I really like that. So he'd walk around. I, I doubt that he could see if you've got, if you've got, you know, something on your eye that's a vision for reading, you're going to be wobbly walking. Yeah. <laughs> maybe that was his problem. <laughs> maybe, maybe. Did you go on the road with uh, anybody? With who? Did you go on the road with anybody um, when when you were when you were you know starting out? Did I go? Well, yeah. Yeah, like like did yeah? Did you like feature for people? Oh yeah, yeah. Like Kevin Nealon and mm-hmm. Kevin Nealon and and uh, uh, Kevin Pollock and. And Rich Jenny. Ah, oh, love Rich love Jenny. Rich Jenny. Just loved it. That was so startling. He, Rich Jenny. The guy could fucking do four sets in one night. Never the same joke. Never the same premise. I mean, he was possessed by comedy, that guy. Yeah, well, and look where that got him. I know. I know. It was terrible. He went... Uh, uh, I remember the day I heard that. I was just like, you... you that just cannot be, cannot be true, cannot be true. <laughs> but I, I had a lot of those. Of course, I never opened for any women because you know you can't have more than one woman on a show because we're going to all talk about our period. Oh, yeah. Yeah. That. And do you know what? Yeah. I used to hear, and unfortunately, that it is still the same. It is still the same. You know, everybody talks about, oh, now people want to kill Asians, or they want to kill this, or they want to kill that. You know, I have to say, you know, some of my girlfriends and I were saying, what about us? We are kissing franchise. And, you know, now during COVID, more women are out of work. Oh, yeah. And men are. Again, I mean, we're, you know... We that women's right movement and all burning the bras that just made everybody's boobs sag. That didn't do anything <laughs> except for about four or five years, you know, for women. Um, uh, God forbid, you know, any of us could talk about anything intelligent. And I remember the first woman I saw that was intelligent that I thought uh-huh. was good. I actually did a Showtime special thing with her. Uh, Janine Garoppolo. Oh, yeah. And I was like, wow, okay. It, it didn't change the way I did anything because I was successful the way I was doing it, but I was taken aback. Right. You know, in a good way, in a way to say, oh, wow, okay. Yeah. You know, she, she talked about, you know, <clears throat> smart, smart stuff. Yep. I remember uh, you were on Women of the Night 4 on HBO when Tracy Ullman hosted. Right, 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 right. Yeah, well, well, Wendy Liebman's another favorite. I love her. I love her. I mean, you talk about a unique style. Oh, my God. Oh, God, she's got three punchlines to every joke, and she's just so quick and unique, you know? Yeah, that way that she, the way she does the aside without looking at like it's an aside... It's just, it's brilliant. And, and isn't it funny? I don't, I, of course, I'm really not up on the new comedians that much, but yeah. I don't see anybody else that has come up with that style. I don't know why it's not patent. Yeah. Patented. I don't know. I guess you just have to have a unique, I just, I think you just have to have a special mind for it, I guess. Oh, no, I can do an impression of her. No, you can do it as a... <laughs> I couldn't write it as good as her, but I can, I've written, you know, I've written stuff. And just, to, you know, see if you could do it. Yeah, it, it's act, she's acting is what she's doing. Yeah. Also, <clears throat> also um, Henriette Mantel was in that episode. I was supposed to interview Henry. her last year, right? She said she'll. <clears throat> she said she would do the podcast right, and then she like changed her mind, just out of nowhere and stuff. Because uh, I think she said she was working on a book, right? And then she suggested that I should go interview Judy Gold. I'm like, Judy Gold's not going to do my show, <laughs> you know. Plus, I heard she's very. Yeah, why don't you call Judy Gold for me? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Plus, plus I. Yeah. <laughs> 
Caroline Rhea, she was in that. She was in that too. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that was so much fun. Oh my God. Well, that's where at that at that taping is where the uh, one of the producers of the Oprah Show was mm-hmm. there, and yeah. that's how I got on Oprah. Oh. None of the others did, but I did. Yeah. That's pretty cool. Now, I, you know, that's funny. Nobody ever asked me that. Well, how did you get on the Oprah show? <laughs> Not that. Nice. My agent uh, manager got a call, and they said, "We, you know, we want to talk to you about Diana." And within a month, I was well, I was headlining at the Improv in uh, Dallas, and I got a call, and my manager says. Pack your suitcase. They're giving you the night off. You're going to Chicago. <laughs> nice. And it was like, oh my god! And it was me and Dom Herrera, who I love. Oh, I love Dom. <laughs> yeah. Oh my god! And uh, that was a. Uh, it was weird because it was like D. H. Hughley yep. was on their Sinbad. Of course, Sinbad kept trying to the show, yep. and I, I finally had to look at him during a commercial break and say, be quiet, because I knew him, you know, and it's like, you're t- taking all my thunder here, let me talk a little bit, you know. <laughs> and, then that, and then what's interesting about that was after we did the show, and it was on Comedians, how, how you got started and everything, Yeah. then we're all just sitting there, and Oprah just starts talking. She, I think she might have even sat on the floor. And she was asking each one of us about growing up, and oh, we all had stories of you know an alcoholic parent, you oh, know, yeah. child abuse, molestation, and I, and she was like, she, and the the same audience was still sitting there. I mean, it got like really heavy. Mm-hmm. And after about an hour, Dom Herrera says, "Well, I don't know about anybody else, but I got to catch a plane. I've got to go, Oprah." <laughs> <laughs> So Oprah says, okay, she says, well, I just want you all to know we filmed that. And Mm -hmm. everybody goes, ooh, right? Because it was really in-depth behind the comedy, right? Basically, it was what it was. And she says, does anybody here mind if we view this, if we put this on the air? Of course, everybody's like, oh, hell, it's Oprah. How can you tell Oprah you can't put something on the air, right? But now, I never got to see it. It only aired a couple of times. I got to, of course, to see the other one, but I've never seen it. Mm -hmm. I don't even know if any of those people even have a a copy of it, but it was really, you know, we were all kind of like, did she know she was going to do that? Is that what she really wanted? Yeah. Knowing her? That's what she really wanted. She didn't want to know what it was like to be a comedian. She wanted to know about what happened to you. Yeah. It made you go into comedy. Yeah. Pretty odd why she's out. <laughs> <laughs> did, did you, didn't you have a role in Jerry Maguire? I did. I still make money off of that movie. Yeah. Tell me about it. How did you get cast? Um... Uh, again, it went back to that the, it, that Showtime special. Uh-huh. Um, Cameron Crowe, of course, the writer director. He told me the story. He said one night, you know, we were casting for the movie, and he said my mom called me. She lives in San Diego, and she said I have found one of the women, the the, the lead woman. Actually, I was supposed to play the sister. I was supposed to play the Bonnie Hunt role. Hate her, too. Uh, <laughs> yeah. They called her Bonnie Hunt, but it didn't start with an H. It would start with a C. I'm not the one that started that. Cameron Crowe started that. Yeah. So, anyway, she didn't want to do the movie. She wanted to do... She was holding out for more money. Mm-hmm. So, I got cast in that role. And at the 11th hour, Bob Hunt comes back and Cameron Crowe has to come to me and say, Bonnie Hunt's going to do the role. And he goes, but I don't want to lose you. I want to put you, you know, in the... And there's so many 
hours of material that nobody even saw that we did in the divorce women's group. Hours, out five weeks worth. We filmed for five weeks. Yeah, wow. But anyway, he said his mom called him and said, I found the woman for you. I found the woman. And he said, she said, I want you to watch this Showtime special. She said, and you tell me which one you think that I think is the one for the movie. And he said, so I watched all the five female comedians. He said, I called up my mom and I said, Diana Jordan. And his mother said, that's right. She's the one. Uh, isn't, it, isn't it great when, the, when, you, when your peers recognize you? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> It's, yeah, it's awesome. It doesn't happen that often. No. So, so um, you've never left stand up, but like, what made you become this guru of what is it? Health, healthcare. Oh, speak motivational speaking. Motivational speaking, yes. Um, I, I could see the t- when the um, uh, what was it like two thousand eight. When everything started crashing. Yeah. Tommy clubs were folding left and right, left and right, left and right. And I'm like, okay, this is not good, right? Right. And so I knew Steve Rizzo, who I love, Steve Rizzo, and he is a really big time motivational speaker, business speaker now. So um, anyway, I called him up and I said, you know, um, I'm thinking about doing you know, speaking motivationally, you know, and he said, oh, you should do it, you'd be great at it, come up with what you want, what you want to say, what's your theme, what's your, right? Mm -hmm. And in about a year, I found out I had breast cancer. And I'm like, oh, well, I guess the theme came to me. So, uh, I mean, I always say that if it had not, I would have never made it through all of that if I didn't have a sense of humor. Yeah. It, it made it so much easier and it made it so much easier on my friends, on my sister, on everybody because I would just, you know, make jokes about it. Of course, I was dying inside, but, you know, I was still... <laughs> so it just kind of was accidentally did some, uh, got booked with some nurses groups and heart groups and, and uh, it, it just kind of took on a life of its own. I mean, I speak to women's business groups about leadership and laughter and, you know, and things like that, but everything is about the healing power of laughter and why it's important to have it in your life and, and uh, incredible health benefits. Yeah, oh, that's great. I'm, I'm glad you've survived that, Diana. I really um, Yeah. because life yeah. is just too precious, you know. Are you doing... Yeah, um, 11 years now, so... Wow, 11 years. I know, yeah. Uh, are you doing any Zoom yeah. comedy shows during the pandemic? There's no... There's really no where to do anything. And now I've done some of the... Some speaking uh, things on Zoom. That's what I mean. That I was already booked for. La- booked for. That's it's what I mean. Awesome. Yeah. It's... Not fun. <laughs> it is not fun. It is very difficult. I mean, you know, when you're used to being up in front of hundreds or thousands of people, and mm-hmm. now you see nobody but yourself or people in a little box, and you don't hear anything, it's, uh, you know, and I'm, I like, because in my speeches you know like I, I have a motivational message and whatever but then a lot of it is very funny yeah. and there's like nobody laughing you know, I'll see myself and I'm like you know I, I have to count the beats right right yeah like somebody <laughs> wanted to hire me to do an hour recently for some nurses uh of just comedy she mm-hmm. says about a kind of cocktails and comedy I said oh that sounds great so I said okay I would do it she was going to pay me. Are you ready? $500. I nice, normally nice. would get five, at least $5,000 if that had been in person. Mm-hmm. So I said, okay, I'll do it. And then I started, it didn't take me but two days. And I thought, that's, 
I'd rather slit my throat than stand there <laughs> and do on camera, right? Right. To nobody, basically. An hour? You know, like I do, If I, for me to do an hour, that would have been two hours worth of comedy. Because I wouldn't have any applause breaks. I wouldn't have, you know. Mm -hmm. And so I emailed her back and I, uh, you know who Jan Karam is? Oh, I love Jan, yeah. I love Jan. She's a good friend. So I emailed her yesterday and I said, hey, I can't do this job. Do you want to do it? You know, face five or five. She goes, sure, why not? So I emailed the woman and I think the woman's pissed off. She didn't answer me. Mm -hmm. uh, but I, I, I said, I told my sister, I said, I will work so hard on that because it's in three weeks. That stuff I need to be paying attention to to make more money will go over to the side. And I'm, I'm going to be smart enough to say I'm not going to do it. So I turned it down. Good for you. Good for you. No, I, I, that was a very big uh, thing for me to do. You know, but I knew it was just going to pull me way off the other way. Nice. What? Uh, so. All right. So I know, I know you want to ask me before we go about me being in Playboy, so we can talk about that. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> First, so, I told you don't bring it up. Oh, well. Okay. I, 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 I was not aware that you were in Playboy, so please tell me about it. <laughs> no, I did. I did tell you that. No, no, no. You told me about it, but I did not know it beforehand. Oh yeah, right. Yeah. Well, that's because it's hit on the internet. <laughs> Let me tell you, okay. people that know, or if I meet somebody and somehow that comes out because I never talk about it. Um, uh, Playboy has those pictures and all their pictures, right. naked pictures. They are. You have to pay to be a member of like the Playboy Key Club, yes. which is, is from Hep Day, right? Yes. And only then can you get in there because I know somebody that has that key, who's a key member, and they showed me pictures on there that I've never even seen of myself that they took that day. And they were fabulous. And I go, oh, my God. I said, you've got to put those out for me. I never saw those. Or I love those. They're so pretty. Because... Now, you know, my friend Rhonda Shear, she's the one that set the whole thing up. So I said to her and these other women that weren't really even comedians, but, you know, I hate to say it, it was hard to find anybody attractive. Yeah. And they, um, uh, I said, now listen, girls, I said, we're not going to do any spread eagle things. You know, all our shots were done separately. Yeah. I said, we're going to do this classy, central, can show the boobs. That's it. Of course, right. this was before the breast cancer, which, by the way, they did a fabulous job. It was great. Mm -hmm. So anyway, I get in there and I tell, remember I told the photographer, I said, I said, I'm not showing anything the other way. And he looked at me and he goes, oh, okay. And I said, no, really, I'm not, none of us are. We're not going to. And he mm -hmm. said, who said that? And I said, I'm saying it. And he goes, oh, I didn't realize you were running Playboy. And I said, Okay, this is my choice. This is how I want to do it. I want to do it that way. Well, you know, after like eight hours, you know, that you're sitting there with your legs apart, you know, going, where's the champagne, you know? <laughs> it's like a, a gynecological visit, you know? It's like, okay, after a while, okay, you know. But, no, I didn't show anything but the upper, right? And a right. little bit of bottom. Yes. I get the magazine, on every one of those girls freaking spread eagle, and I'm like, you bitches, I thought they all knew all along what they were going to do, right? Yeah. <laughs> but I, I, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't want to do that. And just to show you, I watched that um, Mia Farrow, Woody Allen, new docu. Yeah, I got to watch that. It's very disturbing, I will tell you. I'm sure. But, but for us, it's very interesting. But it will, like, 
I mean, I don't, there's four episodes, and I just watched the first one, and I was like, oh, my God. But in there, Mia Farrow's talking, and she's talking about the pictures that she finds of Soon Yi, right? We yeah. all know this already, so I'm not giving anything away. Right. And because she goes back for one of her kids left their coat at Woody's apartment. So yes. she went back to get the coat, and just sitting on his desk are Polaroids. Right of the mm-hmm. young girl. Well, I guess she was like I don't know, seven, fifteen, sixteen. Right. And and Mia says, I mean, they were very graphic. And this is Mia Farrow, present day. She says they were very graphic. She said, not like Playboy. She says these were like hustlers. And I felt so good about myself. <laughs> <laughs> I thought, see? And there is. I mean, everybody knows that. There's a huge difference in the quality of the people and the photographer and the women that are chosen or whatever to do Playboy. But it was right. just, it was like, I burst out laughing. And I go, that's right, Mia. You tell them there's nothing wrong with Playboy. That hustler's got to go. Yeah. So anyway, <laughs> we, uh, uh, so I did it. And, uh, yeah, no, no regret, yeah, no regrets, especially then after going through breast cancer. It's like, okay, well, great. At least I've had my, you know, I have them memorialized forever. Well, I'm going to, I'm going to, uh, ch- uh, see if I can, you know, if I, if I could see that image somewhere, I, I really, I really want to see that. <laughs> you won't find it. Okay. You have to, oh God, you can buy the magazine. Of course, on eBay. Like 20, yeah, for like 20 bucks or something like that. See, you already knew that. I knew you'd be looking for it. <laughs> oh, yeah, I've got a Playboy collection, you know. Uh, when Larry Flint died last week, I was like, yeah, I never liked Hustler. I thought it was trashy and exploitive, whereas Playboy and Penthouse was a little bit more classy, I thought. Playboy, oh, okay. All right, I got another story for you. Okay. Speaking of Playboy. Okay. Okay. When I was growing up, of course, Barbie Benton was just the oh. most gorgeous woman in the world. Yes. So darling, so cute, yeah. so girl next door. And if you have not watched on, um, I don't know what it's on, but it's the thing about Playboy, and it 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 goes between an actor playing half. And then real things about Hep and how he started the whole magazine. It's just great. They, they did it, uh, it's like four hours or something like that, you know. I think it's on Netflix. It's on Netflix? Okay. Yeah. I'll check it out. I think it's called The You After Story. I think that's what it's called. Okay. Really interesting. There's no nudity in it, you know, but it's just really interesting. And Barbie talk when back then when she was... You don't want to see her now. Oh, yeah. I, I can imagine. <laughs> no, you can't. I have a picture I'll, I'll have to send you of me and her from two years ago. Okay. But anyway, Great. so I see her. So all my life growing up in Oklahoma and everything, and but this, you know, we, of course, we knew about Playboy and then and Barbie Benton, and that was like, you know, she was like a movie star. And so anyway, about... Um, a couple years ago, a friend of mine in Beverly Hills had a Christmas party, and she's friends with Barbie. So, okay, you know Joan Fagan? Yes. Joan's my very good friend. So Joan was also at the party, and Diane Nichols. Oh, I've been trying to get Um, her on the show for a while, too. (laughs) She'll do it. I'll I'll, I'll do it. I'll I'll check again in March. Tell them I did it. All you gotta do is tell them I did it. They'll do it. okay? Okay. So anyway... She, so anyway, we're at this party, and I look over, and I see some kind of semblance of Barbie Benton. Mm-hmm. And I go, is that Barbie Benton, right, to, to uh, Joan Fagan? Yeah. And she goes, yes, it is. And she had on this wiry ass, I don't even know if it was a real, we, we think it was a, a wig, but it was gray, it was awful it was long but it was awful it looked like we go is that cat hair what the hell is that on her head right Mm -hmm. and she's about you know 30 pounds heavy 
behavior. And uh, so anyway, I said, I'm going to go over and I'm going to introduce myself and I'm going to tell her I was in Playboy and how much she meant to me. You know, I'm not going to say when I was growing up because that'll make her mad. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, so anyway, uh, I go over and I tell her and a couple of her friends are standing there and I said, could I please get a picture with you? So Joan is standing. I go, Joan, you got to take a picture of me and Barbie. Well, then you got to take a picture of me and Barbie. Okay, I will, but take a picture of me and Barbie. Yeah. And so Barbie <coughs> looks at me, and she gets this look that only other women understand. <laughs> and she looks down, and my boobs look good. You know, they look really good. But I didn't have a low-cut dress on, I remember, but whatever. She kind of had a low-cut dress on. She goes, hold on a second. She goes, I've got to fix something. These are those kind of stories that you think nobody would, is going to believe it, but if I have a witness. Yeah. I have, Joan was there. Mm-hmm. And she goes, if I'm going to have a picture made with you, she said, I'll be, I'll be right back. And she walks over to the little bar area that's, that's just about 10 steps from where we're standing. This is in a home. And mm-hmm. she grabs cocktail napkins and she starts stuffing her bra. I look at Joan. Joan looks at me. We are knowing that this is a moment in history yeah. that nobody is ever going to believe. Yeah. And she, and she goes, she's stuffing her bra so her boobs look bigger than yours in the picture. I said, Jesus Christ. I said, oh, my God, I'm never going to forget this moment. Nobody's ever going to believe this. So that's what happened. So she comes back, and we... Take the picture. I'll send you the I'll email you the picture. Okay. Okay. I have one last question. What yeah. What is your favorite joke of all time? It can be yours, anybody's, it doesn't matter. Well, I I, I know what it is because I'm al- I'm always uh, telling it, especially guys. Uh, only guys really like this joke. Uh, it's about <laughs> Steve Martin when he was you know, doing stand-up, and, and he said, he said, you know, I met this girl, and I was, like, really crazy about her, and I thought, no, really crazy about her, and I thought, well, I'm going to ask her to dinner, even though I don't have any money, I'm broke, you know, but I just, you know, I, I will eat. I'll just tell her, you know, and she can eat, and he said, so I took her to this beautiful restaurant, this beautiful restaurant, yeah. and I said, so, you know, what would you, what would you have? What would you like to eat? What would you like? And she goes, and he, he's thinking, gosh, I'm hoping it's not expensive. And she says, well, I guess I'll have the steak and lobster. And he said, I said, guess again. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty good. It takes good. a second. It takes a second. <laughs> That's pretty good. Oh my God, mine is pretty bad. Oh, this is horrible. Let me hear it. Okay, how do you make your wife scream twice? Uh, screw her in the kitchen. I don't know what. Close. First, you fuck her up the ass, and then you wipe your dick on the curtain. Oh yes, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I actually have. That's one of my favorite routines that I have. That is about. You know, I do. I used to do shows also. I had so much material about men and women. I started uh, arranging it so I could also do a show just for couples. And I got to tell you, Tommy, the men would sit there and afterwards they would go, I never knew that about women. I never knew women (laughs) felt that way. I feel so much better. I thought it was just me. And I go, no, honey, it's not just you. Other men do that too. And women do that too, right? (laughs) So anyway, I used to say, you know, men, let me just say this. And and that kind of joke you can just pull out of nowhere. You can be talking about Czechoslovakia and you know, and you can go, man, let me tell you something about women that they really don't like. And then men, will, the ears will just pick up, right? Mm-hmm. Perk up. And I go, <laughs> number one, don't wipe your dick on the curtain. <laughs> they start laughing, and I go, and equally as important, do not wipe your dick on the nice hand towel. 
<laughs> and what I have discovered is men have come up to me after the show and they say, Diana, we don't know what hand towels are the good hand towels. And I say, <laughs> if it's got an, an initial or a flower on it, your dick doesn't belong on it. <laughs> oh, it's so true. Well, Diana... I see that. You know, I will say this. When I first started out, and I was at Igby's, I'll mm. never forget this night, and I did my show, and I was just starting out. And I think I had like 10 minutes, and Jay Leno was there. Yeah. And all the comics are there, you know, and, and he comes over to me. And I can see behind them, all of them, their jaws dropping. You know. <laughs> yeah. And he says, can you go outside with me for a minute? I want to talk to you. And I, I'm looking at the comics behind him, my bigger headliners and people, you know. And I go, oh, uh, okay, all right, right? Mm -hmm. And so we go outside, and he says, you know, he said, Letterman would love you. He goes, because you got an edge. You got an edge that he will like. He said, I think you could do the Tonight Show. This was before the Tonight. He was doing the Tonight Show. He said, but Letterman would love you and this, with this, this attitude that you have. Yeah. And I, I you know, I, he said, let me give you some advice. I said, okay. He said, pick a topic. Pick a topic. Pick something. Mm -hmm. that will never, ever go out of style. He said, I love doing political humor. He said, pick something that you will forever be able to talk about, and you will be, uh, you know, that will be what you're known for. So I picked men and women in relationships, and it, to this day, has never and will never, ever go out of style. But he yeah. told, he's the one who told me that. He goes, you, but I do do politics and other things and stuff like that, too. But it all comes back to that one focus. That's good. And he's the one that, taught, that uh, told me to do that. That is so awesome. He's, he's a very sweet guy. Yeah, well, you know, you've been doing comedy long enough. You've got a million and one stories. Yes, and... Um, unfortunately, we can't get to all of them, but uh, I'd love to have you back on again to tell more in the future. Okay. All right. Yeah, that was fun. That was fun. Diana, thank so, you so much for coming on. Well, thank you so much. And call my uh, call my friends and, and uh, tell them, you know, that I said they should do it. I will. I'm going to see if I can find that, bar that Barbie Benton. I'm going to see if I can find it right now and send it to you. Okay, perfect. Okay. All right, sweetie. Take care. Thank you. You too. Stay safe. Wash your hands. Wear a mask. Oh, and also wash your belly button. I heard it's very good. Oh, I see. Yeah. <laughs> I think I remember. All right, <laughs> Okay. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Well, there you have it. Diana Jordan. Ain't she a sweetheart? Ugh, what a lovely lady of Southern hospita hospitality. And I'm glad we got to talk today. I didn't think she was going to tell that Playboy story, but she did, and I'm glad, because I didn't even know she was in it. So thank you so much, Diana. Well, until next time, this is Tommy Throwback Kovac saying, there's no shame in living in the past, because the present sucks. Later, dudes.